We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. I will, um, I'll show the work that we do, and in a way, it's quite similar to the Kennedy brothers. We try to reconstruct parts of the Neanderthal, but instead of body parts, uh, what we try to do is to reconstruct their minds. And one day, I imagined that it would be possible, and I don't have a brother to challenge me to keep it going, but I have a whole team. And this whole team helped me to achieve that, and that's what I'm going to share with you guys. So we start with the idea that uh, perhaps we should study human imaginations by comparing to other humans, perhaps humans that have a different kind of imagination, uh, either worse or better, uh, just different. And we thought about the Neanderthals. Uh, and part of the reason is because we know more about the Neanderthals than the other uh, extinct um, hominins. And uh, we also uh, share our world with them for a long time. And becomes clear, and I think you guys all learn about that, that uh, during the time period that the Neanderthals stay uh, uh, on Earth, I mean, they uh, develop these stone tools and, and definitely uh, make it better, but the technology didn't go as far as that. And in contrast, we modern humans, in a very short period of time, we could create not only stone tools, but a whole set of new technology, art, and uh, sophisticated ways to communicate to each other. So which points out that perhaps our brains are somehow different from, from them. So how do we study the Neanderthals and how we can start uh, tracking these uh, questions? So we have bones, we have endocasts that we can uh, predict how their brains uh, would uh, have a different shape or volume. Uh, we have DNA, we can extract DNA from uh, bones of Neanderthals, and we have impressions, and someone might call that art, others might not think that this is art, but they definitely left some impressions for us to try to, to understand. So from the endocast, uh, this is the work from a group from Leipzig um, in Germany, they have uh, uh, confirmed that their brains, uh, at least in terms of volume, is not so different than us. They actually have a little bit in larger brain compared to what we have. Um, but I mean, the endocast doesn't offer too much in terms of how that brain actually function. Um, so, uh, and, and Svan Pabo, also from Leipzig, is a pioneer on uh, isolating the DNA from the Neanderthals and sequence them so we can actually compare the Neanderthal genome to the modern humans. Um, so this is all nice, but actually how do, do we um, understand uh, the Neanderthal brain or the Neanderthal mind in a dish? So I come from the stem cell background, and in stem cells we have something that's called brain organoid, also called a mini brain, because we can recreate those using human pluripotent stem cells. And um, they don't look like that. They're actually <laughs> a simplified, miniaturized version of the human brain. And we have a recipe that we develop in the lab that is quite good to make a functional mini brains or brain organoids. And it always starts from single cells. These are similar to embryonic uh, stem cells or pluripotent stem cells that we can reprogram from people. I can do it uh, from my cells, from your cells as well. 
So from uh, these single cells, we grow them uh, in different media, uh, changing the growth factors, uh, specific growth factors at different stages until we can um, mature them and these networks would just form and become more and more sophisticated. Uh, another thing is that, I mean, they can grow up to a half centimeter and we can keep them alive for up to two years. So these are quite robust protocols because not only you create a single one, but you can create thousands uh, of brain organoids in the same batch. So that allows you to do some experiments with them. Um, and, and if you cut one of those uh, spheres, what you can see is that they, um, they maintain or they mimic some of the embryonic brain structures in humans uh, by having a ventricular zone in the center that sends cells that migrate out and form what we call the cortical plate. As these organoids age, these cortical layers will become more and more well-defined. Um, so this is a, a snapshot of all the cell types that we have if we just age these brain organoids for about four months. We have mostly glutamatergic, these are excitatory neurons, and you start to see uh, two populations in there, so these would be uh, upper and lower cortical layers, but we also have uh, inhibitory neurons as well, a, a small population of um, uh, GABAergic neurons. There are progenitor cells that continue to produce, and at that stage we start to see some glia cells or astrocytes. These are the cell types that helps on uh, the formation of these complex networks that um, we're gonna, uh, I, I'm going to show you how they behave later on. So this is all good, but I, can, I need live cells to recreate those brain organoids uh, in a dish. And the problem is there is no live cells from the Neanderthals. So that poses a big problem. How can uh, we recreate the Neanderthal mind if we don't have the raw material for that? So we turn into genetics since we have uh, their genome. One thing that is possible to do is to compare the genome of the Neanderthals to modern humans, and we have uh, thousands of them, and ask what are the differences between those genomes? What is specific to modern humans that uh, were positive selected in, in, in us compared to them? So if, if we look across all, all the genes, uh, we end up with about 200 genes. And this is, uh, many people have been uh, mining this data set. And these are the, the genes that are uh, different between modern humans and, and, and Neanderthals. And um, instead of looking for all these genes, we decided um, to narrow down this list uh, to three genes because we ask, what are the ones that are highly expressed during early stages of neurodevelopment? And what are the ones that we know that is, if they are mutated in modern humans will lead to a neurological disorder? And these are the three genes. These two here are synaptic genes. They will help how the synaptic or the connections between neurons are formed. And that one is a very interesting one because it starts very early and uh, it's a master regulator of, all, uh, of several downstream genes. It's a splicing reg regulator, a splicing um, uh, protein. So the way we do that is uh, using genome editing, and we use CRISPRs where we can go back to one of our modern human cell lines, and uh, we can change or swap uh, the genetic uh, information from the modern humans to the Neanderthals. So we Neanderthalize the cell lines uh, targeting th those specific genes, and at the end of the day, we have Neanderthal brain organoids, or Neanderthoids, how we, we call them, and, and we can compare. So, I mean, we... we We've done that, we recreate that. And, um, and I'll show you some of the differences that we observe by comparing them with the modern humans. So the first big difference is at the gene expression level. What are the genes that are up or down regulated compared to us? And we have a couple of them. The interesting part is that they are all connected uh, to brain development in several pathways uh, that leads to brain formation. And I'll point to some of them here. This is just a, a list of interesting genes that we are um, trying to understand. There are genes such as nesting, which is a progenitor cell, early stages of neurobrain formations. There are genes uh, such as uh, TPR1. This is a gene that has been implicated in autism, for example, and they are down-regulated in Neanderthals. And there are genes like OTX that, when up-regulated, might prone you to have seizures or epilepsy. So this all happens without genetic modification. I mean, it's just by changing those early genes that you affect downstream uh, genetic signature that might lead to problems such as autism or epilepsy. 
So I told you about uh, one of the genes are actually a master regulator and controls how uh, gene expression uh, uh, or, or splicing is regulated. And this is a gene called Nova one. And this is a reconstruction uh, of uh, uh, the protein attached to the RNA and exactly the, the base pair uh, from the DNA that changes uh, altered that conformation and uh, as a consequence, the RNA splicing would be affected as well. And we are looking into these uh, alter splicing factors and we realize that uh, there is a lot of information in there. Some genes like Homer 1, this is another synaptic gene, uh, have uh, different isoforms between humans and Neanderthals during development. Other genes, and these are actual target of Nova 1, um, they, such as GNAS or PIN1, uh, so these are genes involved in epigenetic regulation, for example. Um, they create a new isoform that only present in Neanderthals. Modern humans lost that isoform from that specific protein. So these are quite interesting observations at the geno gen uh, gene expression level. What happens to these brain organoids if they have that? So the morphology is quite interesting. They start quite similar, but as they progress in time, you can tell that the morphology changes a lot. So uh, while the modern humans uh, brain organoids become a sphere, increasing size, and start to mature, the Neanderthal brain organoids have this kind of popcorn shape. And um, you can measure the diameter of them, I mean, how they grow. And already we can see that the Neanderthal uh, organoids probably have some kind of cell death or some, some problems to develop uh, compared to modern humans. Also, uh, the size of the sphere is different, but also, I mean, the way those spheres um, are, uh, uh, are shaped, which might point it out to some differences, as I said, in, 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 in cell death or apoptosis, but also in migration, the way the cells migrate. So just by looking at these pictures, uh, we can tell that there is migration defects and there is a way to test that. You can plate some of these cells and, and, and let them migrate by themselves. And what we observe is that the Neanderthal cells, um, they uh, have a defect in migration. They migrate, migrate is low but they go uh, farther than human cells. So even a small migration uh, might affect your uh, entire brain trajectory during development. So if you look at the neurons, I mean, we also see differences in, in, in specific subtype of populations from, from the cortex. Uh, this is uh, one of the cortical layers, and, and we observe that SATB2, it's a neuron that participates on intracortical communication as well as intra uh, communications between layers. It is um, dramatically reduced in Neanderthal cell lines compared to controls. So everything is all about uh, morphology and, and how the cells behave or, or the shape of these organoids. What about the function? Can we actually measure how the communication or the network is being affected? So to do that, we use a tool that is called a multi-electrode array where we plate these brain organoids into a multi-electrode uh, in the bottom of those dishes and we can record, uh, we gain an activity map as well as a raster plot in every trace here, it's when a neuron spikes. And uh, if you have uh, several spikes uh, at the same time, we call that a burst. And when burst spikes in the same channel, we call a synchrony event. And um, since we can keep them alive, we can see that they evolve. And we did that. And um, when we start, we actually didn't have what to compare. So I'm showing here just some of the work that we did in 2D. This is without the three-dimensional structure. And most of the data, uh, it is uh, up below 5 hertz. So this is just an average measure of the brain activity. So what is the idea? What is our goal? So a mouse brain is about 18 hertz, and a monkey brain is about 20 hertz. So other people have also created different protocols for brain organoids, and although they can also keep them alive uh, for uh, a long period of time, um, they were not able to see an increase in activity, suggesting that there is some problems with maturation. But um, uh, we are glad that the protocol we have, we were able not only to keep them alive, but to reach a level of um, activity that's much higher than was ever uh, recorded before in vitro. So if you have that much level of activity and synaptogenesis going on, it means that you can record something else. 
And this is uh, what we call brain oscillations or brain waves, uh, the activity that you can actually measure through the skulls using uh, electroencephalogram or EEG. So we can actually measure um, those EEG waves from these brain organoids, and uh, we can compare them um, uh, to preterm babies. So we created this uh, machine learning uh, algorithm, and we trained that in an unsupervised way uh, by exposing them to different EEGs from preterm babies and asking the machine uh, to tell the age of uh, the person. So once the machine has done that, we uh, feed them with our brain organoids, EEG, and we ask what are uh, the predicted age of the organoids. So uh, this is uh, how the machine will do uh, in a perfect condition in the red trace. Uh, the data is actually on, 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 on the uh, black uh, trace as well. You can see that we have a very good prediction up to uh, 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 above 25 weeks. And the reason why the machine is not good to predict be below that is because we simply don't have any data from human uh, preterm babies below that. The babies will die, and we don't have a way to record a uterus that is no invasive. So that's why we don't have a good prediction. But what is the prediction that we can have? And uh, I'll show you just one example of one of the parameters from the EEG, which is the space between um, the interval of activities. So if you just um, look at an adult EEG here, so it's quite complex. Uh, this is a preterm baby. You see this uh, spontaneous activity transient followed by a quiescent period where the brain is just silent when you're super young. And, um, and here is on, in our brain organoid. So the brain organoid is much similar to a preterm baby than to adult baby. So that's what we are modeling. We're modeling early stages of neurodevelopment. So as we grow older, they, the, the interval between those uh, activity becomes shorter and shorter. That's why we have this complex EEG in, a, in adult. So the organoid, as we age the organoid, the interval also reduces and reduces to a level that gets close to that red bar about 40 weeks or nine months. That's equivalent to a newborn um, healthy human baby. So that's what we can get with these uh, human organoids. So now that we have lots of activity to compare, I mean, how does uh, the Neanderthal brain organoids compare to modern humans? So we have been studying uh, that from different angles. And I'll, I'll first start by uh, showing what is the level of synaptogenesis, how many brain cell connections uh, the Neanderthals can make compared to modern humans. And we see that there is almost 50% reduction, which is similar um, to someone with autism, for example. So definitely a lower level of synapses compared to controls. We also measured them on the multi-electrode arrays. And uh, uh, what we have here in, in, in this part is just the raster plot and the activity map, and then some of the quantifications that we have. The number of spikes, uh, the level of activity per neuron per minute is way reduced uh, to what we expect for an isogenic control. The same is true for the firing rate for this, these neurons is also reduced compared to isogenic controls, which again points to the fact that these networks are uh, just not good enough or not mature enough to the level that we would expect for modern humans. So I, I hope I could tell you that by recreating these Neanderthal brain in a dish, we could say that they have differences uh, in morphology, in synaptogenesis, even at the network level. But the question is, are those differences better or worse than the modern humans? And I made like some analogies with autism and other neurological disorders, but the truth is that we don't know. So we have been looking at that uh, using different experimental models, and I'll just show you uh, one thing that we are uh, excited about. And this came from this idea that if you have brain oscillations from people working together, they might actually uh, synchronize or they are more prone to, to, uh, to work if your friend uh, is with you than uh, a stranger which suggests that to achieve something, um, uh, uh, to achieve a specific goal, it's better to work with someone that you like. So we have been um, tagging these uh, human brain organoids into robots. So that's a way for the robot to experiment the world. And uh, we are doing that uh, in two ways. The first step is just uh, teaching the organoid how to move a robot. And that's what you're gonna be seeing in this video. 
so this is a, a, a robot that is being moving all the legs just by the frequency of uh, oscillations coming from a human brain organoid. So the idea is uh, now to do the second step, which is to create a feedback loop so the organoid can actually learn something and the robot can tell by experiencing the world. So soon we're gonna be doing the same experiments using Neanderthal brain organoids. We can, we can see if the, ro the robot can actually learn something better or not than humans. So I'll finish here by summarizing uh, that uh, we have a model, a uh, brain organoid model coming from stem cells that can recapitulate human development. We can reconstruct uh, evolutionary steps that recapitulate um, uh, key features of the Neanderthal uh, development, uh, we think so. And this might be a, a paradigm uh, for learning if you put them back to a robot or something. So these are um, Kleber and Priscilla. These are the brain masters in the lab. They are the ones who developed this nice protocol that uh, everybody's excited about. And uh, these are my collaborators for this project, uh, both Katerina Semendeferi, your lab, uh, the Wojtek lab, and uh, Eric Green, who helped us on the genomic analysis of the Neanderthals. And these are my funding agencies, and I'll stop here. Thank you very much.